Um, we invite a friend to come here um, to talk about sustainability and agriculture's uh, you know, ecological sustainability and economic justice issues. Again, because you can't just fix your farm and live on an island, especially not these days with rising seawater. Um, but we uh, um, think it's entirely appropriate to have Fred here with us on our 40th anniversary. He grew up on an Illinois farm where he says fighting soil erosion was a deep rooted moral value instilled by his parents and grandparents. And so it's no wonder his uh, career is focused on the sustainability of agriculture in rural communities. Um, he also had deep ties to the Land Institute, uh, including his participation in their fellows program at one point. And uh, now he has been um, given the, the uh, opportunity to serve as president of the Land Institute. And uh, he is going to inspire us this morning. Thank you. Good morning. When the Kansas Rural Center was founded, I was also in my mid-20s. It was more like 20 weeks than, uh, than 20 years uh, in 1979. Um, but I have uh, gotten to know uh, the history of the Land Institute, which as Mary said, that was founded just a few years earlier out of uh, the same uh, kind of melting pot of circumstances. I've gotten to know the history uh, of the Land Institute uh, like I have the history of my family farm uh, back in Illinois. Um, and uh, so I, I feel like uh, just as I've been along for the ride in that sense with my grandparents and great-grandparents, uh, I've been uh, along for the ride with Wes and, and Mary and others. And one thing that I uh, have come to think about starting nonprofits uh, is that it's a similar observation to starting small businesses uh, or starting a farm, uh, for that matter, uh, is that it's really hard. Uh, statistically, most of the time it doesn't work. Uh, starting small businesses or small nonprofits is a little bit like a tree trying to reproduce. Uh, every year you have uh, thousands or tens of thousands of seeds produced representing all the startups. Uh, some of those uh, actually are recruited into seedlings. Some of the seedlings uh, uh, move on to be saplings. Some of the saplings move on from there, and a tree is doing well uh, if with that constant attempt to reproduce, uh, it, uh, it generates one new full-grown tree uh, in 40, 50 years. It's not quite that hard to start a nonprofit, but it's, it's somewhere along those lines. And one of the things that that implies is that when it works, everything had to be just about perfect. All the circumstances, uh, all the stars had to align uh, in just the right way. Uh, and that means that no positive factor uh, is too small uh, to not be instrumental. Uh, and so I feel fairly confident in saying it's much less likely there would be a land institute that, that stuck and worked if there was not also a Kansas Rural Center that stuck and worked and the mutual support that those things played. Uh, so you can rest assured that in addition to all of the good uh, that this organization has done directly, uh, indirectly, uh, you've enabled uh, good that others have done also. Um, that's something you can take pride in. I'm going to go a little bit further back uh, uh, than 1979, a little bit further back uh, than 1976 uh, for a moment. Uh, and, and it'll go a little like this. I am certain that my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our nation impels. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. 
nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive, and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. I'm convinced that you will again give that support to leadership in these critical days. In such a spirit on my part and on yours, we face our common difficulties. They concern, thank God, only material things. Values have shrunken to fantastic levels. Taxes have risen. Our ability to pay has fallen. Government of all kinds is faced by serious curtailment of income. The means of exchange are frozen in the currents of trade. The withered leaves of industrial enterprise lie on every side. Farmers find no markets for their produce. The savings of many years in thousands of families are gone. More important, a host of unemployed citizens face the grim problem of existence, and an equally great number toil with little return. Only a foolish optimist can deny the dark realities of the moment. Yet our distress comes from no failure of substance. We are stricken by no plague of locusts. Compared with the perils which our forefathers conquered because they believed and were not afraid, we have still much to be thankful for. Nature still offers her bounty, and human efforts have multiplied it. Plenty is at our doorstep, but a generous use of it languishes in the very sight of the supply. Primarily, this is because the rulers of the exchange of mankind's goods have failed. Through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence, have admitted their failure and abdicated. Practices of the unscrupulous money changers stand indicted in the court of public opinion, rejected by the hearts and minds of men. True, they have tried, but their efforts have been cast in the pattern of an outworn tradition. Faced by failure of credit, they have proposed only the lending of more money. Stripped of the lure of profit by which to induce our people to follow their false leadership, they have resorted to extortions, exhortations, pleading tearfully for restored confidence. They know only the rules of a generation of self-seekers. They have no vision, and when there is no vision, the people perish. Restoration calls, however, not for changes in vision and in ethics alone. This nation asks for action, and action now. The year that was 1933. Let's see if we can cue up a click on this here. It's the on off the side. Turn off, there you go. Right, there we go. 1933, March the 4th. We did Inauguration Day, March the 4th, back in those days. Uh, this uh, slide here is a podium in the FDR Presidential Library and Museum. Uh, in the Hudson River Valley, uh, where they have a copy of this speech permanently mounted, and they have spotlights permanently uh, playing on this podium, and you're invited to stand behind it. And I will swear to you that no matter how much of a smooth operator Franklin Delano Roosevelt may have been, how much of a wise man he may have been, Standing at that equivalent podium on the Capitol steps, he had to have felt a little bit like the dog that finally caught the car. You're president of a country that's going in the tank. Congratulations. But these were his words, uh, that he, uh, he rallied the nation uh, behind a, a program of suspending despair, suspending inaction, uh, and getting down to work. Uh, and so these words, uh, these words, words speak to us uh, in certain ways today. Now in 1933, uh, the, the teeth of the Great Depression, 
the problems were more obvious in some ways than the problems that confront us uh, day to day um, uh, in terms of uh, the material deprivation that people were experiencing uh, with the, the collapse of the economy. Um, at the same time, uh, the problems were uh, more abstract uh, because they concerned movement of money in the economy. Uh, so compared to March 4th, 1933, uh, on November 8th, 2019, uh, our problems are simultaneously more dire and concrete uh, because while they may not be a plague of locusts, uh, they concern the very uh, biophysical systems, uh, the biogeochemical systems that sustain life on this earth, uh, the global climate. Uh, doesn't get much more concrete than that. But at the same time, this problem is more obscure and more abstract because it has not yet intruded into the day-to-day -day, uh, field of vision of most people in this country. Uh, so we can learn some things uh, by way of emulation, and we can learn some things uh, by way of, of avoidance uh, from uh, that day in 1933. Um, so as far as uh, concerns our time uh, here, Climbing the technological learning curve on this particular clicker here. Figure out how to hold it. I miss the two buttons in the middle. Two buttons in the middle. Yeah, you don't have to point it in. You hit the lights and down. Yeah, is that the other okay. thing? Yeah, so there's. I just came here from 1933. <laughs> and, uh, my telegraph key hand is working really well. Clicker hand, uh, not so much. So uh, as we troubleshoot this, um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll move on and maybe we'll gain the, the slides uh, after a bit. So our, our climate concerns here in 2019 uh, are fairly dire. The IPCC, uh, this is a good slide, well it's a bad slide, this is the right one to be on. Uh, the IPCC published a special report uh, last year. Uh, the report documented uh, how human activities uh, from the industrial era to present have already caused a full degree Celsius of global warming. So the big ones here, okay, good, thank you. Uh, this warming, quote, will persist for centuries to millennia and will continue to cause further long-term changes in the climate system, such as sea level rises. So this is the global warming that we're locked into even as we speak, even if all the smokestacks go dry today. It bears some thinking about. We're locked in to those sea level rises and that degree of warming, even if we shut everything off at the wellheads today. The report continues, quote, global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees C between 2030, which is the year that my son will turn 18, and 2052, if it continues to increase at the current rate. Impacts include higher average temperatures almost everywhere, quote, hot extremes in most inhabited regions, end quote, uh, excessive rainfall in some places, uh, heavy drought in other places, the effects include impacts to plants, to insects, to vertebrates, uh, and also the rather chilling phrase is present, quote, transformations of ecosystems from one type to another. Uh, in a, a fairly understated sentence, the report says, quote, climate-related risks to health, livelihoods, food security, water supply, human security, and economic growth are projected to increase. Translation, broken lives and broken ecosystems uh, will be the consequence uh, of the route that we're proceeding on now. Um, to avoid overshoot, uh, the IPCC report tells us global carbon dioxide emissions must decrease by about half by 2030 and hit net zero by 2050. Uh, in a less understated sentence, uh, this will require, quote, rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy, land, urban, infrastructure, and industrial systems. These systems transitions are unprecedented 
in terms of scale. Uh, the way that this uh, partitions, I swear I'm hitting the button you just showed me here. There we go. Yeah, we've got it here. We just need to wait uh, on it. This partitions out about like uh, follows. Agriculture, our area of special concern here, uh, is a significant contributor uh, to climate change. But as Mary already alluded to, uh, as agriculturalists, our primary, uh, the primary hat that we wear uh, uh, in terms of climate change is, is actually um, not overwhelmingly a farmer hat, it's a citizen of the world hat. And that goes not only for experiencing the effects, uh, but also for contributing uh, to the issue uh, through our participation in all of these other sectors uh, that are listed here. Um, so we have, uh, besides climate change, uh, we have other concerns uh, that are going on uh, that lay outside of the realm of climate, outside of the realm of sustainability. Uh, we have a range of economic justice uh, uh, issues that are going on here. Um, we, uh, we have issues that affect rural areas, uh, rural communities, uh, that affect farms in terms of loss of community vitality, population loss, uh, farm consolidation. Uh, but many of the same issues affect uh, urban neighborhoods. Uh, we have economic strains uh, and dislocations uh, that are affecting a broad swath of people uh, around the country. Um, but in particular, they're more heavily felt by people of color uh, and women. Uh, we don't partition uh, the burden equally, uh, and we labor under um, that injustice. Uh, overall, uh, we, uh, we have what uh, Naomi Klein uh, has called a transition into the gig and dig economy. Uh, we're having a pell-mell transition into underemployment in the service sector, the gig part, at the same time that our level of extraction uh, is only increasing, uh, the dig part. If I tap out a certain pattern, okay, here we go. I think it's dot, 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 dash, dash, dot. I think it's what this is. Um, and so if, if that wasn't enough uh, that we uh, face these problems society-wise, um, uh, rather than agriculture uh, being poised to simply charge out uh, and save the day uh, from a position of great security, uh, we have, uh, to state the obvious, problems of our own in the agriculture sector. Uh, we have the age-old problem of soil erosion and soil degradation that's, uh, that's still going on. Um, you know, maybe, uh, can you control this from back there? Maybe we'll just do it that way here. I'm, I'm not sure uh, what the, the issue is here. Uh, we have, uh, you know, I, I always, uh, go for the, the dramatic photo of, of gully erosion, I really ought to have a photo of flat, uh, flat field to explain that real erosion is happening and sheet erosion is happening on it. Um, we have water quality issues, we have soil carbon loss issues, uh, we have farm profitability issues, etc. So we have our own issues uh, in agriculture. And we'll advance the slide please here. Uh, so to try to, uh, to systematize uh, these problems uh, that we're experiencing here uh, in view of moving to a solution, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, something called the Safe and Just Space Framework uh, that economist Kate Rayworth, uh, a UK economist, uh, developed about seven years ago uh, for considering uh, how we're called uh, to live uh, well on the planet. Um, she debuted this, uh, this framework about seven years ago. Two years ago, she figured out how to appeal to the American palate and wrote a book about it called Donut Economics, which is, uh, is something I can get firmly behind. Uh, in, in this safe and just space framework, a safe existence is one that avoids violating uh, any critical planetary boundaries, uh, like atmospheric CO2 concentration, uh, like the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, like extraction of non-renewable resources. A just existence is one where the vast majority of the people in the world attain certain minimum standards of nutrition, good health, access to energy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you plot these two sets of factors on two different circular diagrams, 
and then superimpose them onto one another uh, in a way that the acceptable uh, minimum, the acceptable floor for human well-being uh, is uh, the inner ring of the donut, uh, and the maximum burden that we can place on the planet, the ecological ceiling, is the outer ring of the donut. Uh, we have something uh, uh, that we can work with here uh, that helps us understand this uh, narrow band that we're called to exist in uh, on the planet. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, uh, just a year ago, another team of researchers in the UK uh, took up this framework, this donut economics uh, framework, uh, to systematically analyze the global situation here. Uh, and they computed uh, a set of indices uh, for uh, almost every country in the world, all you know, 190 nearly, uh, or however many countries uh, there are at the moment. Um, here are just two examples, uh, one for the United States uh, and one for Sri Lanka. Uh, and so you can see here that the U.S. is uh, performing very well in meeting its social minima. Uh, in fact, uh, those blue bars are all the way up uh, to that minimum uh, ring there in almost every area. I'm not personally convinced uh, that equality is quite as high as is depicted there. Uh, and I'll be honest and say that the, the, the one that's DQ, Democratic quality, and there have been some days I've had my doubts about that one uh, in recent years uh, also. Nevertheless, uh, we're meeting a lot of these minima. At the same time, we are wildly in overshoot uh, on exceeding uh, these thresholds, on living within our means uh, in terms of what we appropriate uh, from the ecosphere. Uh, if we look at uh, the Sri Lanka diagram, uh, we'll see uh, the excellent performance on living within means on the planet. Uh, we also see a much more patchy performance on meeting these thresholds. Um, and so if we go uh, one more slide here, um, if, you, if you run this for all these countries, as these researchers have done, um, you, can, uh, you can try to see how we're doing as a planet on this. Uh, on this chart here, uh, the number of biophysical boundaries that we've blown by uh, is the x-axis, the horizontal line. Um, the number of social thresholds that we've achieved is the y-axis, the vertical line. Uh, and so if we were doing very well, all these circles, one for each country in the world, would all be in the upper left. That's not where they are. Uh, uh, for the most part, we see a distribution uh, where countries that are living within their means uh, are not supplying a very abundant existence for their citizens. Countries that are supplying a, a prosperous existence uh, are running the planet down. Uh, and so we have a dilemma here. Uh, we are busting through uh, this donut uh, in multiple places. Um, and so if we, if we wanted, as, uh, as an experiment here, to try to cobble together a model country uh, here that is doing well on all these variables, and if you parse through all these countries, uh, we would come up with a hypothetical, uh, sustainable and prosperous country uh, that would use the, the nutrition pathway of Eritrea, which actually has very good human nutrition, a uh, sanitation pathway that nobody's quite demonstrated yet, but Tajikistan is actually the closest to achieving in the world. Uh, we would have a median income and energy use pathway uh, that uh, Moldova uh, has. Uh, we would have a healthcare pathway that nobody's demonstrated yet exactly without busting through the limits. Uh, but Vietnam is, is somewhere close. Uh, we would have a secondary education pathway that Sri Lanka has modeled for us. We would have a human equality pathway that Ethiopia has achieved. Um, here's a surprising one, the full employment pathway of Rwanda uh, that, that comes the closest to full employment of any nation without, without exceeding planetary limits. Uh, and pathways to democratic governance and overall life satisfaction have not been demonstrated by any country yet. Um, so even after we put together that imaginary Franken country, uh, one thing we noticed is that there's not a lot of Global North countries on it. A lot of Global South there, so that's a, a clue here that we have a lot of work to do uh, and that we may need to look uh, to some of our friends uh, for some help here. Um, let's advance the slide, please. 
Um, and we go back to this chart uh, that we, uh, we looked at before to try to think about how do we go about putting together uh, this model country uh, in light of where these emissions come from. This is one way to slice them up by sector of the economy. If you advance another click, please. Uh, here's another way to slice them. 100% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from human economic activity, uh, almost by definition. Um, and this illustrates uh, the point uh, that we still struggle with the fundamental issue uh, that economic activity and extraction and emission uh, are tightly coupled. Uh, we found no way yet to decisively decouple those things. Frankly, given the thermodynamics involved in digging up buried sunshine, the accumulation of millions of years of photosynthesis and burning it all at once, it's hard for me to believe that we'll ever fully decouple those things. We certainly uh, haven't done so now. Uh, and so we have this additional task uh, of decoupling human well-being from economic growth. Uh, since we know it's economic growth that's running the planet down, especially when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so not only do we have to uh, kind of uh, jump all these hurdles uh, that we mentioned, but in light of the timetable for climate change, we've got to do it fast. One more slide, please. Um, and, and so here, of course, is the time when the Land Institute person talks to you about roots. Um, our, uh, our foundational paradigm, as you know, uh, is, uh, is that we are uh, trying to move beyond confronting problems in agriculture to the problem of agriculture. Uh, there are a lot of ways that we can slow down the rate of resource loss, um, soil erosion, soil carbon loss, water pollution, uh, by farming better within the bounds of the crops and the cropping systems that we have. Uh, we also know that if we want to decisively make this better, if we want to confront the age-old problem of agriculture, uh, we need to mimic nature and specifically the structure and function of native ecosystems uh, a lot better. Uh, they're what built our soils to start with, uh, and if we want to conserve our soils over time, uh, we're going to have to, to mirror those systems. Uh, and so the, the two things that characterize those natural ecosystems are perenniality and diversity, uh, which prairies uh, are the model of. Um, now at the same time, uh, I will posit here uh, that if we look at all of the wins and the losses that we've had socially, culturally, with respect to equity, uh, over this whole 10,000 year journey, uh, over this whole 100 year journey that we've been on, the key values that emerge for a just and sustainable human existence on the planet uh, are also those same familiar to perenniality and diversity. Um, another slide, please. Um, we, we understand intuitively the value of diversity in agriculture. Another slide, please. And at this point, I think it's fairly intuitive to us uh, what the value of diversity in society is. Uh, it's not only in the context of what's right, uh, it's in the context of what's effective. Uh, we can inform each other, we can, we can educate each other, we can pool our stories uh, across lines of gender and ethnicity and age and class, uh, global north, global south, red state, blue state, uh, and we can move along a lot further. Uh, another slide, please. Uh, perenniality may require a little bit more explanation uh, as to what that means when it comes to human society. Um, and, and what I uh, have increasingly come to think is that we have suffered as a civilization uh, from a lack of perennial regrowth structures uh, from which we can uh, constantly replenish and renew our good decision making and our wisdom about how to live together. Uh, we have uh, often have highly individualistic uh, situations that require generation after generation of, of people to wake up day after day and make uh, good decisions every single day uh, without a lot of help. Uh, and so uh, uh, a society that embraces perenniality to live in a just way and sustainable way uh, would be one where we weave sustainability and justice into the culture, uh, we weave it uh, into the institutions. Um, that's a social perenniality vision. Next slide, please. 
so what is agriculture's role in ecological sustainability and economic justice? Uh, since that's the title that we're working under, um, it still starts with the soil. It still starts with food. Uh, that's, uh, that's the fundamental contribution. Uh, we can never forget that, uh, that the keystone of civilization is stewarding those things. Uh, we also need to remember that agriculture is called to work with uh, the non-agriculturalists in societies uh, to work on the problem of agriculture and also to work on problems that are happening elsewhere in society. Um, so we're, we're fixing our extractive system of farming and we're fixing our gig and gig economy. Uh, you can go a little too far uh, with the old timey kind of notion that uh, agrarian uh, areas, rural areas are you know, well springs of purity that have to rescue the misguided urban areas. You can go some distance with that, but you can go too far with it. Uh, but certainly, uh, if we as rural people, as agricultural people, have the opportunity to lead and facilitate, uh, we should certainly take it. Um, and of course, we, along with everybody else, have to confront climate change. Next slide, please. Um, so what are some principles for a policy framework uh, and a, collection, a collective action framework that's going to confront these problems. Um, number one, uh, whatever we do has to be ecologically sound. That's the, mention, the, the lesson uh, of that donut framework, uh, that if we lift people up uh, and we, uh, we run down the planet, we've accomplished nothing. On the other hand, what we do has to be uh, just and equitable and, and kind. Uh, if we ensure that we have uh, a sustainable existence uh, over the centuries, uh, but it's one where people are living in a downtrodden state, uh, we've also accomplished nothing. Um, so we need to confront uh, fossil fuel emissions, we need to confront mining of the soil, and we need to confront exploitation of people. No policy vision is complete uh, unless it has some scope um, that, uh, that attaches to all those things. Um, another principle for action here uh, that's key uh, is that we have to align our day-to-day -day incentives and disincentives uh, in a way that's conducive to actually getting the results that we want. We know the story when it comes to farm policy that it turns out that if you subsidize certain behavior for a century, uh, people engage in that behavior whether or not it's in keeping with the conservation values that you know, everybody to some extent uh, shares, and that we're going to have a permanent obstacle uh, to farming out our values uh, until we change that incentive structure. This is true in its way in every domain of policy, in every domain uh, of society. This is part of this social perennially vision uh, is we have to have uh, culture uh, and collective action that helps point us in the right direction rather than that we have to swim upstream against, that we have to constantly make decisions outside our immediate self-interest in. Uh, above all, an overriding priority uh, for any policy approach, any social action, collective action approach, uh, is that in the era of climate change, uh, it has to revolve around immediate action. Um, in, in many cases, uh, this is going to involve taking things that we can do technologically today uh, and facing them in as quickly as, we, as possible. Uh, a drawdown uh, of fossil fuel emissions is one such thing. We have the technology to turn off valves right now. Uh, we have some catching up to do on the economic context for that, um, but we have no excuse for not taking immediate action on, on things that can be deployed immediately, uh, like drawing down, starting to draw down our fossil fuel use and our carbon emissions from it, uh, and like deploying uh, as much renewable energy and as much energy efficiency technology as we have available today right away. The other thing that we have no excuse for not taking immediate action on is for throwing ourselves at filling in the technological gaps that we should have filled in decades ago. Um, can you imagine uh, if we had fully invested in renewable energy uh, 30 years ago. Can you imagine if we had fully invested in perennial grain crops 30 years ago? Um, as the saying goes, the best time to plant a tree 
It was 30 to 50 years ago. The second best time is today. <clears throat> so our immediate action uh, also can't overlook uh, the need to stop stalling and get to work on these transformation uh, projects. <clears throat> so some principles there for whatever policy we adopt. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, some of our discussion here, some of these discourses uh, are framed around uh, the Green New Deal conversation uh, that's been happening nationally for the last year, uh, and then this revival of interest in the Old New Deal, which I, I giggle inwardly every time I say Old New Deal, uh, uh, but uh, it, it's a timely reminder to think about this, uh, this pivotal area. Um, uh, so the achievements of the, the Old New Deal, the original New Deal era, were significant. If you'll recall, uh, the mid-1932, as late as mid-1932, um, not only was the nation locked in economic depression, day-to-day uh, -day lives and well-being stalled out. Uh, in, in the worst cases, uh, people literally starving. Um, simultaneously, an ecological catastrophe in the Great Plains and the Dust Bowl, um, and political momentum of approximately zero, uh, as late as mid-1932. Uh, utter lack of consensus, uh, seemingly uh, no possibility of finding a way forward uh, as the, the opposing political forces are just butting against each other. If you fast forward to a year later, one year and one election later, things have changed a little bit. We have bold new leadership in place. Um, there's something like a national consensus in place that we needed to take action on the depression and the dust bowl. It was a consensus that was composed of a lot of people agreeing and the people who didn't agree realizing that they'd better shut up for a while because they were looking increasingly unreasonable. But a, that's what a consensus is built from sometimes. And, and so not only uh, were actions happening, uh, actions being dreamed up, actions were well underway by mid-1932. Uh, in the first 100 days alone of the FDR presidency, uh, Congress passed the Emergency Banking Act, the Government Economy Act, uh, an act enabling the abandonment of the gold standard, the Securities Act, the Homeowners Vote Act, Civilian Conservation Corps Act, Federal Emergency Relief Act, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and lastly, the Beer and Wine uh, Revenue Act. Not only did all that get through Congress, uh, but many of these programs were actually getting traction uh, because they were being uh, uh, implemented with a lot of zeal. Um, and so one thing the New Deal era had going for it is that the crisis was right up in everybody's faces. Everybody could see the effects of the Depression. A lot of the country could see the dust clouds uh, coming over. Um, another thing uh, that the, the successes of that era had going for them uh, is that uh, the people at the time uh, cultivated a willingness to experiment, to try things, to fail fast, to adjust and move on. Uh, by that 100-day mark, they had already stepped away from some programs uh, that weren't working and replaced them with new ones uh, that were a second try. Um, maybe uh, the, the biggest innovation, though, of the New Deal era is the idea of working from two lists simultaneously. Uh, a list of reforms uh, that were incremental, uh, that were uh, easy uh, to get support for, um, that kind of flowed through existing paradigms, uh, and then a second list of things that were more radical, things that were more transformative, uh, and implementing kind of iteratively uh, things from both lists. Um, there were minor changes to banking regulations, uh, minor changes to how transportation network was administered that are on that incremental list. Uh, on the other side, there was some stuff happening that was pretty radical, uh, especially if you look up the history of the Resettlement Administration. Um, there was uh, a proposal uh, uh, separately to start implementing a lot of federal policy by flowing it through Democratic councils of local citizens. Our system of uh, soil and water conservation districts is the, the only part of that experiment that, that stuck over time. Um, and so they, they, they pulled stuff off of both of those lists. And that's a lesson that we can learn from today. Um, on the other hand, uh, the caution that we have to exercise as we contemplate 
what, what the old New Deal uh, can uh, teach us uh, for a Green New Deal or for our situation today um, is that the focus in 1933 was revving up the economy. Um, and today we know that that runs smack into this, act, this coupling issue, the fact that economic activity is tightly coupled to extraction and emission. Um, and so uh, we have to exercise uh, great caution and, and use our powers of insight you know, pretty, pretty keenly here uh, uh, when we talk about uh, approaches that are, are going to spool up economic activity. Uh, lest that, they, uh, that they, they worsen the condition uh, that we're trying to improve. Next slide. Uh, the other lesson uh, from the, uh, the New Deal era is that the beer part uh, was pretty important. This was an actual uh, election poster from the Roosevelt campaign. Turns out that if you will serve people beer legally after a drought of a few years, they'll be on board for quite a few things. Um, so uh, if you'll advance uh, another slide here. So uh, it's some specific thoughts uh, on, on policy here. Um, taking something from list one, uh, from the incremental change list, um, uh, one thing that the current Green New Deal proposals get right <clears throat> is that we need to retrain people uh, for a range of green jobs. Uh, this includes not only things like uh, solar panel installation and weatherizing homes, uh, it also includes farmer training programs and programs uh, to match aspiring farmers uh, with farmland that, that needs to be transitioned to a successor. Um, uh, Robert Jensen and I uh, wrote an article at resilience.org uh, earlier this year that called out the efforts of the Land Stewardship Project in Minnesota, uh, specifically on this, uh, but there are many good programs uh, around the country. Uh, on the other hand, from list two, from that more radical list, uh, we also know from some very concrete, um, you know, physics logic here um, that we can't get away from the need for immediate policy and collective action to start phasing out fossil fuels. Uh, an example for how to go about this is the cap and adapt uh, framework that the Land Institute's own Stan Cox uh, has proposed along with a co-author uh, that would ramp down and gradually phase out fossil fuels, not particularly gradually, because he proposes doing it by 2030, um, and, and have and enforce a hard and steadily declining cap uh, to make sure it actually happened, at the same time spooling up uh, as much renewable energy and efficiency as we can get. Um, and we can pull things uh, from both lists including another list two item of taking immediate action on perennializing our agriculture, uh, both grassing down as much acreage as we can afford to in the permanent pasture and rangeland, and fully supporting an effort to, uh, to fully develop perennial grain crops. Next slide, please. Um, one way that this will work, um, and I'm uh, hit it two more times, please. And uh, one more time, and one more after that. Um, one way this will work here, one way to visualize this uh, is uh, through the 50-year Farm Bill framework that uh, you may remember the Land Institute proposing some years back. We're actually in the process of rebooting this project uh, for the climate change era, so look for more on that in the coming months. But in one of these graphics uh, um, that we used some years ago, we envisioned a 50-year uh, phase in here. Uh, if you'll click uh, again, um, and again, and again, uh, essentially stacking benefits of changes that we can make right now, all this one, uh, to the agriculture that we have, and then increasingly transformative benefits from perennials um, over time. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, we'll think for a moment about our theory of change. How on earth uh, do we get this done? How do we get this enacted besides flying people with legal beer and wine? Um, uh, so, uh, you know, one, one way to do it uh, is to adopt a unifying worldview uh, that encompasses both the transformative and the incremental. Uh, we can set a goal, uh, but we can also plot a pathway to it that runs through some incremental steps that people can wrap their minds around so that our incremental progress can not only accomplish a little something, it can also push us further towards the point where we're ready to commit as a group uh, to bolder change. 
Uh, another approach, another theory of change here uh, is that we need to phrase ourselves uh, so that we soar over uh, the ideological uh, encampments that people have as much as we, poss as we possibly can uh, and uh, visualize a world that's beautiful and inspiring at the other end of this. So click again if you would. Um, uh, I've been using this slide all year here uh, since the poet Mary Oliver uh, passed away early in the year. She once said of her work, if I have any lasting worth, it will be because I've tried to make people remember what the earth is meant to look like. We need to soar over uh, the places that we're camped out on. Um, uh, and, uh, and then uh, the other thing I'll cite here uh, is that we, we have to embrace uh, building social capital and relating to each other in community uh, first, last, and all the time. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville uh, is the, uh, the original scholar of the American way of relating socially. He's a, a French scholar that, that took a, a tour of the United States in 1830. Uh, he wrote, feelings and ideas are renewed, the heart expands, and the human spirit develops only through the reciprocal action of human beings on one another. Um, and, uh, and that in America, uh, Tocqueville points out, uh, we do this um, to a greater extent than any other country heretofore with civic associations. We blur the line between individuals and households on the one hand and kings and presidents on the other hand with our associations, much like the one uh, that, that was gathered uh, here today. Um, and, and so it's a matter of um, not uh, deciding, are we going to work individually? Are we going to work outside of the context of policy collectively? Are we going to work through policy? It's of diving into all three and using them to mutually reinforce one another. Um, another slide, please. Um, this is one of my favorite headlines uh, here uh, from a New York Times article last year. Stopping climate change is hopeless. Let's do it. What are the odds uh, that we're going to get uh, national consensus on ramping down fossil fuel emissions to zero or nearly zero by the time my son is 18, 12 years from now? Not very big, not very big. But we need, in the face of that situation, to relentlessly ask the question, but what are we going to do? I learned this question from Wes Jackson. Uh, Wes learned it uh, from the writings of the Gandhi uh, movement in India. This was one of Gandhi's lieutenants um, pioneered this question. Uh, when people, uh, when you point out an injustice, you point out a necessity, uh, and people relentlessly explain uh, all the reasons that it's utterly impractical uh, uh, to take action on, on this thing that's clearly necessary you relentlessly reply, but what are we going to do? We know uh, that our moral compass and our existential compass on this planet uh, demands decisive action. So there is no other sensible choice other than to dive into this. Probability of immediate success be damned. Um, maybe we'll succeed immediately. If we don't, we'll just have the best possible kind of practice and preparation for the moment uh, when the conditions arrive to get a consensus. And remember our New Deal lesson, sometimes the conditions for a consensus arrive quickly. Sometimes when the problem gets into everybody's faces, like climate change is going to start doing increasingly in more of the world, sometimes the moment for consensus arrives. One more slide uh, here. Um, so uh, so this, is, this is my son here, uh, gazing, uh, gazing down this furrow back into his history. Um, Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher, uh, who's not typically known for being simple and direct, uh, did once say, the future is there in the present. Fairly simple uh, and direct. And of course, the present carries echoes of the past uh, in it. And so what is uh, Philip Busey seeing as he looks down uh, this furrow? I hope one of the things that he sees is that he has a bequest. Uh, when Philip was about three days old, and uh, when we uh, moved on the, the home place, uh, we lived on the home place near Adrian, Illinois, before our move to Kansas, uh, we brought Philip home to a house that 
was built on a foundation that had been put up by Philip's great, great, great grandparents. Six generations of agrarian affairs in my family have been transacted on that farmstead, uh, and also six generations of Tocquevillian civic association affairs. And so my great-grandfather, Millard Lambert, my son's great-great-grandfather, in February of 1928, sat in that farmhouse and wrote the following words. About 15 years ago, I was selected president of the Adrian Corn School. This is a town that peaked at about 150 people uh, in about 1910. The organization was only two or three years old then. I wondered why they elected me president. I had never had any public responsibility and it looked to me that it was a sure way to send this infant organization into the bow wows. As I look back on that occasion, I can see the principal reason they elected me president was that they had very few to choose from, and most of them have suggested it would have backfired. Yesterday, this is 1928, 15 years in, yesterday was the closing of the four-day session uh, that this, uh, this corn school in a town of 150 people held. An entire new executive committee of five were elected, not because the retiring men had been efficient, 1928, so there's one gender being mentioned, not because the retiring men had been efficient, but because this is a fine way to develop leadership, to turn it over. These new men average about 30 years of age, and most of them have little or no experience in farm organization leadership. However, when they were being haphazardly nominated, no such word as decline was even breathed. The boys out this way some time ago cut that word out of their dictionaries. A dozen other fellows of similar age and experience were available for the above positions, and they, if nominated, would have accepted 100%. About 50 men were present yesterday, and 25 boys and girls registered in the juvenile corn contest. Most of these children walked in, being dismissed from school by consent of the county superintendent of schools. One farmer walked eight miles, two different days, and he's the type that always has plenty to do at home. What I have been trying to say all this time is that we have confidence we can do anything out of Adrian, end quote. So we have a bequest, not only my son, but all of your sons and daughters, literal and metaphorical, all of you in this room. We have a bequest from our ancestors near and far, our ancestors literal and figurative. What distinguishes us as a species from the average monkey is our predilection for making great changes on the land and great changes in our society. Indeed, that's exactly what's gotten us into trouble uh, all these past millennia. But now at this point, we need to take ownership of our skill at making change, because that's the only thing that's going to get us out of trouble now. Um, so taking on and holding climate change, soil degradation, social inequality, loss of community, uh, will require much of us, it will test our abilities, it will test probability individually and as a society. Uh, but we can confidently take the viewpoint that we can do it if we work together. And last slide here, uh, a painting by Winslow Homer titled The Last Furrow. Uh, we can know, uh, we can have a consciousness such as the farmer pictured here uh, that we have done well, uh, even though some of our efforts uh, turn out not to have been the efforts that stand, that stand for all time, we have, we have faithfully executed the concept of stewardship as we know it, and we have constantly expanded our minds on what we need to do next. And so as we, uh, as we plow this last furrow, uh, as we focus on keeping it straight because we're disciplined, uh, our eyes are nevertheless wandering up this grassy slope, this uh, slope of herbaceous perennials in a polyculture, uh, across which somewhere lays home. Uh, and we know uh, both that we, have, we can be proud of where we've been, and we can be even more proud of where we're going. Um, and so that's the role that agriculture can play in ecological sustainability and economic justice. Thank you very much.
Yeah, great question. Yeah, and so that corresponds to, there was a slide that had, um, that had uh, changes in conventional ag, changes in increased adoption of organic ag and perennial ag. Um, ultimately, soil was not meant to be turned over. Uh, and so ultimately, we're only going to get ecological satisfaction by having continuous perennials. Until that day, uh, we need to drive uh, as much tillage out of our conventional farming as we possibly can with no till adoption. We need to move as much conventional farming to organic uh, with extended rotations uh, that, that feature years of perennial forage and, and uh, feature uh, uh, cover crops so that we're reducing tillage in those systems. So we need to, need to reduce it. Yep, they're in the back. Um, one of the things I keep hearing or coming to conclusions is that the appetite for change is not well developed yet, but it's on its way. And one of the things I, I think about all the time is CO2. If CO2 were not invisible, but was like a red cloud coming out of the rooftop of everybody's home this morning or tractor pipe or everything in between, and it didn't dissipate, the alarm would be like that. And to me, education or reframing things to help awareness of, although it's invisible, it's deadly for us in the long term. Is there anything that's been discussed along that line that we can take home? Yeah, well, so that's, uh, that's, that's absolutely right, uh, this education factor. The, the two things, I guess, that I would point to are, number one, um, we're at the point where, for most people in the U.S., um, they're not casually noticing anything as they walk out their door on the way to the car in the morning. And so one thing we need to do is draw people's attention uh, to things that one doesn't casually notice, but one has to look a while at. And so that takes place in the context of, of formal education. It takes con place in the context of adult education. And I'll especially uh, commend the idea of citizen science. So if you saw in my mind, uh, there's Aubrey Strike Krug, uh, who some of you know at the Land Institute, David Van Tassel, who some of you know, are really focusing in on this. Uh, that if you involve people in the inquiry process, if you have people monitoring, soil health, you have people monitoring insect populations, you have people keeping weather logs, then they start to notice things that aren't in their faces yet. The second thing is that we need to bring the experiences of people on the coasts and in the global south and in the more arid parts of the world closer to home uh, for people uh, who are more fortunate here because uh, people manifestly have it in their faces uh, elsewhere and uh, we need to, need to ground it. Um, and and we, we, need, uh, we need to pile on to all these efforts to connect these thoughts uh, because we don't know when the moment when consensus becomes possible is going to arrive. Um, and we want to make sure that we are totally schooled up and we have our local educational programs, we have our civic association programs, our policy advocacy programs. We want to have those revved up when that moment, that moment arrives. And that means uh, launching now, even if we're not 100% sure we see the conditions for success yet. growing 
showing a lot more diversity instead of tied to corn, soybeans, and cotton down south and open that window. I think the biggest thing we could change on the landscape is the farm bill. And, you know, that won't be ready for another four or five years, a new one. But we need to start that process of how we set it up now so when that time comes, maybe we could get enough census for the new farm bill to be totally different. Amen to all that. Uh, and I think we have to remember that at least since the 1930s, uh, as hard as it is to get farm bill reform, every farm bill cycle from now on will have the most favorable conditions for success and reform that we've ever had. Because every year, every five years, at least if we see uh, the trend we're in now continuing, we see this amazing and wonderful infiltration of the soil health concept, the soil organic matter concept, the cover crop concept, the perennial concept, uh, into the conventional ag discourse. How amazing is it that if you open up any conventional commodity crop magazine today, there's always at least four articles about cover crops, right? I mean, it's a start, it's, it's just a toe in the door, but we have a toe in the door, and, and so if we, uh, we need to go after a reorientation of the farm bill along these lines to go from subsidizing specific crops to subsidizing outcomes. Um, we need to go after it to make it happen this cycle. If we don't make it happen this cycle, we need to rest assured that next cycle will probably be even more favorable for getting it done. So, yes, yes. All right. Thank you very much.